Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. Harvey Weinstein was a master of the Hollywood universe. With his brother Bob, he founded Miramax, an independent distribution and production company named as a portmanteau for his parents, Miriam and Max. For a time, everyone came to Miramax, producers, directors, stars, and beautiful aspiring actresses. Today, Miramax is bankrupt, and Weinstein is serving what is, in effect, a life sentence in New York for sexual assault as he prepares to defend similar charges in Los Angeles. Premier author and journalist Ken Oletta is with us. Ken has written 13 published books. He has been covering Harvey Weinstein for two decades. Ken's latest book is a fascinating account of the rise and fall of a great movie mogul. It is entitled Hollywood Ending, Harvey Weinstein and the Culture of Silence, who was this man, and what explains his astounding come down? Ken Aletta will tell us. We're pleased to welcome Ken to the program. Thanks, Jim. So, Ken, uh, why did you start covering Harvey Weinstein? Well, I profiled him in 2002 in The New Yorker, a long 20,000-word profile. And in the course of that profile, which I described him as, as a bully, talented, nevertheless, doing brilliant movies, uh, but abusing his staff, abusing other people verbally, in some cases getting into fistfights. But I came within inches of nailing him on sexual predation. I had heard that he had raped a woman at the Venice Film Festival in 1998. I could not get the woman or her person who joined her in a potential lawsuit against Harvey, could not get them to speak on the record. I confronted Harvey. He denied it. So we were faced at The New Yorker with the question, do we run a story where Harvey denies he abused someone and we have no one on the record saying he did? Uh, not even on background saying he did. And so we, we decided we couldn't do it. But I pursued him over the years and when Ronan Farrow uh, left NBC, which was a scandal in itself, they fired him, didn't run the story he had on Harvey Weinstein. He came to me, and I introduced him to The New Yorker. He, he helped break the story, as did two brilliant two New York Times reporters. And, but they were writing about Harvey's and his abuse. I was interested, what made Harvey the monster he became? How did he use and abuse his power? What was the nature of the relationship with his brother? And, and the enablers, who were all these people who knew or should have known over these decades that he was abusing women, how come they kept silent? So those were the things I was interested in, in exploring in a book. Okay, so before we get to his flaws, perhaps you could tell us something about his background and also what was his talent? What was the essential talent that he had? What was the secret of his success? He grew up in, in Flushing, Queens, working class family, uh, went to the University of Buffalo, became dropped out after his junior year and became a rock, very successful rock promoter. It was only after he gained power as a rock promoter and then in the movie business that he abused women. So power became an aphrodisiac. His talent it was several fold. He was very smart. He read a lot. And he understood that the secret to a good movie is not the acting or the directing. It's a good script. You can have a good actor, or great actors, you can have a great director, but if it's a lousy script, it's going to be a lousy movie. And he understood that. He was also a brilliant marketer. He knew how to sell a movie. He knew how to, he had Trump-like talent to, to brand something. And, and he did very successfully. And also, it, he was making the kind of movies, you think of Pulp Fiction, My Left Foot, The Crying Game, Shakespeare in Love, The English Patient, all these amazing movies. He won 81 Academy Awards. And if you're an ambitious actor or actress or director, you don't want to be in Superman movies. You want, you want to do that for the money. You want a chance at an Academy Award. Harvey Weinstein was a magnet attracting talent to Miramax because he gave him the opportunity to work in a really good movie. Now, was he a movie maker or a producer or a distributor of movies? He, initially, they were distributors. They didn't have any money. But in 1993, Disney acquired the Miramax Company. And then he had money to produce as well as distribute movies. So that's when he started producing movies and doing a brilliant job at it. 
Now, uh, he had all this money from Disney. How much uh, money do you think uh, Disney put into Miramax? Oh, well, Miramax, at one point, it, Harvey was supposed to knock over $30 million to produce a movie. He did movies for $110, $120 million. Drove Disney crazy, but they were afraid of him. They didn't want to take on Harvey Weinstein because Harvey was very popular, very popular with the press, and was perceived as, as an outsider, as someone challenging the establishment. And Disney did not want to be in his course halves, and, and so they weren't. But Harvey, Disney put mil tens of millions of dollars and made a lot of money on, on Miramax. Uh, but in the end, they fired Harvey. Harvey claimed he left, but they, he didn't leave voluntarily. They did not renew his contract in 2005. So, so did Miramax itself ever make money apart from the, the private planes and the cars and uh, uh, all the trappings of uh, success that Harvey Absolutely. Enjoyed? Miramax made money and, and Bob Weinstein, the brother, who was his equal partner, created something called Under Disney of Dimension Films. Scary movies, some of the, uh, the movies that, that were not like the Miramax movies but actually made more money than Harvey's movies did. So yes, they made, they made a lot of money for Disney. And in the end, Disney sold the company and made money on that as well. Um, so uh, where did uh, all this uh, leave Harvey? He, uh, uh, his brother ultimately fired him, didn't he? Harvey uh, and, and his brother were as close as, you couldn't get between the two brothers. And, Yet Har Bob constantly complained to Harvey. Harvey, you're losing your focus on the movie business. You want to be in the, in the fashion business. You're buying Halston, you know, for instance. Or you want to be in the TV business. You, uh, you know, America's Model. You did all these things that were away, taking us away from the movie business. And he was spending money like a bandit. And, and Bob was much more focused on dollars and cents and, and, and managing the company. So there's tension growing between the brothers. And in 2015, in a meeting where Bob challenged his brother, Harvey suddenly hauled off and sucker punched him, breaking his nose. And then they made up again, and the brother, always, two years younger than Harvey, always looked up in many ways to his brother. But in the end, when he learned that Harvey was, ex when Harvey was exposed in October, of 2017, first in the New York Times, and a week later in the New Yorker, as someone who had abused over 100 women. That's a lot of women. And at that point, Bob, who's weighted vote. It's almost one for every Academy Award he won. <laughs> more. More. <laughs> but, but at that point, Bob joined with the board and fired his brother. But without Bob's vote, they could not have fired Harvey. OK, so you, uh, you are famous for getting inside your subject's heads. Uh, and you've described a man who uh, was angry, had problems managing his anger. He was at times violent toward his brother, I think. Didn't he throw a reporter down a flight of stairs? He did, and put him in a headlock as well. Put him in a headlock. Brent Graydon Carter, the editor of, of Vanity Fair, with a fist fight, but he went outside and then didn't, <laughs> didn't do it. Didn't follow through. So he had, and uh, he seemed to be... Uh, uh, I mean, more than a libertine, he was a sexual predator. Um, what accounts for behavior like this? He was a monster. Well, you know, I tried to find a rosebud, um, and, and I explored many th different theories as to what it would be, and I talked to many medical professionals who didn't know Harvey but knew this kind of behavior. In the end, I concluded that he was a sociopath. The definition of a sociopath, medical definition, is usually pivots on three ingredients. One is lack of guilt. Two is lack of empathy. And, and three is narcissism. Now, you could have all three of those qualities and not be a sociopath, but then you haven't raped over 100 women, as Harvey did. So I'm satisfied that Logic breaks down, and all my efforts to come up with theories as to, you know, was it his mother who was very rough on, on the boys when they were young? And that was Miriam. Miriam was very, yelling all the time. Yelling so much that, that Harvey's friends, who I interviewed for the book, 
growing, friends growing up, they play poker every weekend, but they refuse to play at Harvey's house. Why? Because Miriam yelled too much. Harvey, you're too fat. Harvey, stop eating that. Harvey, this. Harvey, that. But what about Bob? Uh, she, he was subject to the same yelling. From he his was, mother. but he, he not as much as Harvey. Uh, he, first of all, he was two years younger. Harvey was more dominant in the house. So she finished yelling by the time she got to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, and Bob was not a sexual predator, and 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 Harvey was, which again deepens the mystery. And in the end, you say. My God, maybe there's no other simple explanation other than that the guy's a sociopath. Now, we've heard about a lot about this phenomenon recently. Perhaps it's Me Too. We've heard a lot of it in the private sector and with corporations. But is there something unique about the movie business? Uh, is it the casting couch syndrome? Well, what's unique about the movie business uh, compared to, say, the insurance business or the automobile business... Or J.P. Morgan. Or J.P. Morgan. You've got beautiful, young, ambitious women working side by side with powerful men, be they actors, directors, or studio chieftains. And it is not uncommon for a studio chieftain or a producer when the young, attractive woman says, oh, Mr. Weinstein, I love your movies. Oh, Mr. Weinstein, that was a brilliant marketing campaign you just ran. It's not far-fetched to think that that powerful male interprets a compliment as a come on, that she really wants to go to bed with me. And so that's part of it. The other thing is, uh, the casting couch has a long history, as you're suggesting, in Hollywood. You had Zanuck, you had King Cone. Absolutely. You had but you had others. very few examples of rape. You had some, but very few. I mean, it was really seduction. And, and you want to be in this movie, and it was implicit, you know, and you, you, you went to bed with the person. That's different than rape. Rape is a criminal offense. Harvey was found guilty of a criminal offense of rape. And so what Harvey did is so extreme. That, that it, it, and if you think about all the individuals who, since Harvey, have been exposed, some before Harvey, Roger Ailes and, and, and Bill O'Reilly, but after him, Mario Batali and Charlie Rose and, and some of the others, Matt Lauer, et cetera. Les Moonves. Les Moonves. Harvey's the extreme. Well, maybe Moonves is close to that extreme. But when you get to the Charlie Roses and the Matt Lauers, or what's his name, from Minnesota, Oh, my God, Al so Franken. Al Franken. Oh, but he didn't do anything. <laughs> but, but that's just the point. The point is that we group all these people together, and liberals who believe in, in, in pardons or rehabilitation, they don't believe you give a pardon or rehabilitation to someone like that. Now, Harvey doesn't deserve a pardon or, or rehabilitation. He deserves to be in prison. But some of these other people, you know, I mean, if they show contrition and, and, and they show that they, they and admit they made a mistake, and they won't do it again, and they've taken some other actions that are believable. Pardon them. Don't, don't group them all with Harvey Weinstein. Well, I think the, the real element that may distinguish rape from, does distinguish rape from the casting couch in perhaps most cases, uh, is the element of consent. Uh, and uh, that is a vital element. Now, Harvey claimed that all these hundred women consented to his advance. Well, this is, this, as a lawyer, you, you know this better than I, but I cover the Harvey Weinstein trial every day. And Harvey's case pivoted on the notion that it was consensual. That these women, if you look at the record he produced, they continued in many cases to see him, to write him emails, to say, I miss you, big guy, et cetera. Several, four of the six women who testified had continuing relationships of some sort with Harvey. And so he claimed that, therefore, that proves it was consensual. The prosecution hurdle was to demonstrate that it wasn't consensual, that there are multiple reasons why women continue to keep in touch. And they called to the witness stand Dr. Barbara Ziv of Temple University, an expert on rape. And she testified that 40% of American women who are raped continue to have relationships with the person who raped them. And the women on the stand... Sexual relationships. Sexual relationships, absolutely. And, and, and the woman on the stand who testified in Harvey's case, when asked by, smartly by the prosecution, why did you continue to keep in touch with Harvey? They gave varied answers, among them, 
I was in denial. I didn't think it really happened to me. I blamed myself. I, it wasn't his fault, it was my fault. I was afraid. I didn't want him, anyone to know. I didn't want my mother to know. So they gave various reasons. But why does that rationalize uh, the coming back for more? It, well, that was hard. Or, or does it belie the claim that uh, there was no consent in the first place? No, it, 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 the argument that the, process, that the women were making and that Harvey were making is that they, not Harvey was making, the prosecution was making, the women were making, is that these women were afraid of Harvey, afraid of their life being blown up. Yes, were they ambitious? Of course they were. And, and one of the reasons why they went up to Harvey's suite, not knowing they'd be raped, was, was they ambitious. They wanted to be in his orbit, his magnetic field. But nevertheless, they didn't expect he would rape them. And then if you go through the reasons I just gave, they were in denial, they want people to know, they'd want to act normal, but they still wanted something from him. But, but they didn't want to be raped. And the jury ultimately believed that they didn't want to be raped and that, that it was not consensual. Uh, well, this was a very strange case of rape, as garden variety rape cases go. I mean, there was no DNA evidence. Uh, it was not someone springing out of the bushes in right. Central Park. Right. Uh, there was no uh, corroboration. Corroboration is no longer required, but it's nice to, for the prosecutor if there is some level of corroboration. And, uh, no evidence that any drugs were used, in, uh, uh, like the Bill Cosby case. And you had, uh, uh, the, of the three uh, counts where he was convicted, all three uh, victims uh, had consensual sex with him after the uh, uh, episode that they complained about. Um, so uh, do you think the case was mishandled by the defense? You can make that argument um, that, I mean, Harvey's initial lawyer was Ben Brofman, who you know, brilliant criminal defense lawyer. Brofman, Harvey drove him crazy and he, he left the case. You could argue, and, and I think I would, that Brofman probably would have done a better job on the case. His lawyer, Donna Rotuno, believed that a woman prosecutor, a woman defense lawyer, would do much better up against women asking them tough questions than would a male. She asked very tough questions of Jessica Mann, who was one of the, the key witnesses against Harvey. And I argue in the book that her questioning of Jessica Mann, who was reduced to tears, and then at one point after crying and the judge pausing the trial so she can recompose herself, she then turned to the jurors, and they were as far away as you and I are, and she said, you have every reason to believe that I acted, that I did neurotic things and, and I have things I, I should apologize for. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on March 25th, 2005, I'm making up the date, it was around that date. There's, there's, it's undeniable that Harvey Weinstein raped me on that day. And when she said that, first of all, chills through, throughout all the people and the spectators, but the jurors who had notebooks at that point started writing in the notebooks. You just knew that was a very significant moment in the trial. Uh well, there was another episode in the trial which uh, lawyers find troublesome. It's the issue on appeal. It's the so-called Molyneux issue. Molyneux was a case uh, where uh, the Court of Appeals, I think, in New York said uh, the only crime that you can prove at the trial is the, are the crimes that are alleged in the indictment. And William Kennedy Smith, you remember, was a uh, member of the Kennedy family, um, nephew of... Uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy uh, was indicted in Palm Beach uh, for rape, and the um, um, prosecutor tried to introduce evidence of uh, a pattern of conduct of this kind, and I don't know, six, ten other women. And uh, the judge struck it all out, wouldn't allow the women to testify because she ruled uh, that it would be prejudicial. Now, why is that case different from the Weinstein case where three other women, not named in the indictment, 
were permitted to get up and testify that uh, they'd been raped by Harvey Weinstein. The judge allowed those three mile an hour witnesses as the Cosby trial judge allowed five mile an hour witnesses and that they became very incriminating, a pattern of behavior. Harvey's appeal to the appellate division of the state court was in part based on, on, on the Molyneux case, that, that, he, that the judge made a mistake in allowing three witnesses to appear. The appellate court actually supported the judge's decision. And it's now going to the Court of Appeals and whether they, and that's, that's a central part of Harvey's appeal. Molyneux is prejudicial to him. It was not the only one, but it's all based on the judge's behavior, including that, that decision. Well, I think it's the law that the judge has uh, discretion to allow what uh, in the federal court is called similar act uh, evidence, and it's admissible to prove intent or uh, signature characteristics. Right. Uh, uh, the murderer uh, uh, carves an A in, uh, in the body of, of each victim. Uh, but uh, there is the issue of prejudice, and one judge once said, and this is hanging a lot of dirty linen on the thin peg of relevance, uh, and uh, you were there at the trial. Uh, how did it, it impress you that there were not only the women who were named in the indictment, but then they called three other women to testify to conduct that you could argue was similar, but it really isn't a pattern. It was because once uh, it's established that he uh, was a predator with respect to three women, what does it prove that there were three other women? I mean, you sat there and you wondered why the judge did it. On the other hand, the witnesses were, what they said was believable. You, uh, they claimed that Harvey stalked them, that Harvey abused them. And, and knowing Harvey as I did, and knowing his pattern of behavior, and knowing the stuff that Ronan Farrow and the two New York Times reporters had reported, and the things I reported in my book from women I interviewed, it was totally believable that he did this. Legally, whether the judge should have allowed the three witnesses is a separate issue. But when, I, when they spoke on the stand that I believe that they were telling the truth, yes. They were telling the truth, but then what did it prove with respect to the three he was charged with having raped? They, they, they proved a pattern of behavior, which is why the judge allowed it. Pattern of behavior. Um, now, another question for you. Uh, um, we see uh, a lot of discussion nowadays about uh, people of uh, tremendous talent uh, whose uh, talent is kind of tossed down the drain because they were guilty of uh, some uh, uh, sexual misbehavior or some other misbehavior and immediately comes to mind uh, Ezra Pound who was a fascist or James Levine who uh, uh, molested a young man or maybe young men. Uh, he was a conductor. Uh, Picasso a great painter, but uh, undoubtedly uh, had a casting couch for his models. Uh, what do you think of all that? I mean, should we be rejecting the art of these people because no. they're tarnished? I, I, I mean, Ariana Huffington, someone I know and, and, and like, wrote a book, a biography of Picasso, saying we should not, years ago, claiming we should not hold him in esteem as an artist because he abused, was unkind to women uh, and was a sexist. I don't buy that. Um, if Ezra Pound is a good poet, it doesn't matter that he was, you know, he was a fascist. And it, I mean, it, it matters that he's a terrible human being, being a fascist, but his art stands alone. Now maybe you wouldn't celebrate him and give him a dinner party or, or give him an exhibit, but his work stands alone outside of that. Picasso's work stands alone out of that. And, and Har the fact that one of the challenges for me in writing a book about Harvey Weinstein, a biography of his whole life, is even though I, I believe and he was found guilty of being a monster, he did brilliant movies. And if you're going to write about a whole person's life, you can't ignore the brilliant movies. You, you have to include that. So I have a question for you, Kendall Letta. And uh, Harvey Weinstein is now in jail in California as we speak. He's awaiting further charges that are similar to those he was convicted of. Uh, you attended the trial. You followed him for 20 years. Is, was he just a monster? Is there anything to be said for him? Oh, yeah. You, uh, you, he was a monster. 
uh, a, a, an unpleasant man in so many ways, but also a great talent. He did amazing movies uh, and had a real talent to make those movies and spot those movies and, and recruit the actors and directors to be in those movies. And you can't deny that. And, and, and I wouldn't deny it. And my book affirms that. But it also affirms the larger point that he was a monster. And, and I mean, his mother yelled at home in his house. Harvey, that normalized that kind of behavior for Harvey. If he worked in, in Miramax or the Weinstein Company after, he was yelling all the time, verbally abusing people, sometimes throwing ashtrays at them or cell phones. So there was something unhinged about Harvey Weinstein. Well, you, you did a terrific book. It's a marvelous read. And uh, thank you so much for coming by. Thanks, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations. Please visit our website, uh, conversationswithjimziron.com. Meanwhile, take care, be well, and all the best.